Okay, so we are continuing our series through the Minor Prophets, and today we are in the book of Habakkuk. Well, have you ever looked around the world and wondered why does God, that either God is good, but too weak to stop it, or God could stop it and doesn't, and therefore isn't good? Well, this book, Habakkuk, addresses that issue. Habakkuk is formatted differently than any of the other minor prophets we've looked at. The book is not written directly to the people. Instead, it begins with a prayer of complaint from Habakkuk, a complaint to God, and then God responds to Habakkuk. And then there's another prayer of complaint, and then God responds again. And then finally, there's a prayer of praise and celebration. So it's different. It's not written to the people, but it's just this back and forth between Habakkuk and God. So the people of Judah are never actually addressed in this book. But the message of Habakkuk that Habakkuk receives from God applies to the people of Judah, and it applies to us today. Now, Habakkuk was written sometime in the 600s BC, so about 2,600 years ago. Uh, this is a time period that Second Kings tells us there was a series of really awful kings in Israel, idol uh, idolatrous kings, and the wealthy people were abusing the poor, crime was rampant, even violent crime was rampant. Everything seems to be going wrong. And this is the world that Habakkuk was living in. He was watching all of this happen and asking, where is God in this? So let's read the opening of the book his first prayer, and here's what it says. The pronouncement that the prophet Habakkuk saw, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. This is why the law is in effect, or, and strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. So Habakkuk calls out to God and asks, why, God, are you allowing all of this evil? And then God responds in the next part of chapter 1. Let's look at verse 5. Look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded. For us their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge ahead. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles swooping to devour. All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. Then they sweep by like the wind and pass through. They are guilty. Their strength is their God. So God says that he is raising up the Chaldeans, which is just another name for the Babylonians. He's raising them up, which means that God is giving them power. But God also knows that the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, are birds. They're more fierce than a pack of wolves at night. They're like eagles that swoop in and devour. All of these metaphors convey an army that is fast and ferocious, and God says they come to do violence. That's their goal. And they gather prisoners like the Babylonians were known for taking the enemies captive and taking them back as slaves. They collected so many slaves, it was like sand, the grains of sand. Their army was so fierce, it says that they mocked the kings around them. They had no respect for any fortified city, they laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. So when the Chaldeans came to a walled city, a fortress, they would just build a siege ramp, a giant ramp out of earth. Telling Habakkuk, you ask why I'm allowing so much sin in Judah? Don't worry. I am planning a judgment for the sin of Judah. And it's coming from a nation that's even more evil, more evil than you can imagine. So God actually began this by saying, that you wouldn't even believe. So that naturally raises a question for Habakkuk. Habakkuk thinks to himself, wait a minute, the judgment for the evils of your people is to raise up and empower a nation that's even worse? 
Habakkuk's first question then is, how can God allow so much evil in Judah? And God's answer is that he's going to allow an even greater evil. And that leads to the next part, where Habakkuk prays. But then Habakkuk says, that doesn't make any more sense either. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing, he says. So then how can you bless or empower the Babylonians who are evil? How can God allow the wicked to swallow up Judah? Judah is sinful, yes, Habakkuk knows that, but certainly they're not as bad as the Chaldeans. So this plan of God makes no sense to Habakkuk. And in the rest of chapter 1, Habakkuk details the evils of the Chaldeans. They kill and they enslave. So what is God doing here? And then God answers Habakkuk again. So let's look at chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by faith. So God says that, yes, the Chaldeans are evil. Speaking of the Chaldean king, God says he enlarges Sheol, and like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. Won't all of these take up a taunt against him with mockery and riddles about him? They will say, woe to him who amasses what is not his. How much longer? And loads himself with goods taken in pledge. Won't your creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you wake up? Then you will become spoiled for them since you have many as the water covers the sea. Woe to him who gives his neighbors drink, pouring out wrath even making them drunk in order to look at their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace instead of glory. You also drink and expose your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will cover your glory. For your violence against Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of animals will terrify you because of your human bloodshed and violence against lands, cities, and all who live in them. What use is a carved idol after its God says, trust me, I am doing far more than you know, and justice will be done. In the beginning of chapter 1, Habakkuk wondered how God could let this sin go unpunished, and then God responds by saying he's raising up the Chaldeans to conquer Judah. And then Habakkuk asks, how could God allow an even more nation, a more evil nation, to judge Judah? And God responds, not to worry, because God has already planned for another nation to enact judgment on the Chaldeans. God is planning a century ahead. And so Habakkuk responds again in chapter 3. Look at verse 1. A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk, according to Shiganoth. Uh, so this prayer here is uh, identified as a Shiganoth. But what's that? It's a Hebrew word for a prayer that is filled with emotion, but also a sense of victory. So it's an emotional prayer about this victory that's coming. So this introduction to chapter 3 tells us what's coming next. Habakkuk is going to praise God with emotion and with confidence. So let's continue in verse 2. Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk says that he's heard God's word and he stands in awe of God. He knows God is powerful and good, and he knows judgment is coming, both against the people of Judah and against the Babylonians. And so all Habakkuk can do is praise God and trust in the mercy of God. Habakkuk continues in the prayer describing the power and authority of God. And then Habakkuk concludes at the end in verses 18 and 19, Yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. And that's the end. Habakkuk can rest knowing that God is in control even when bad things are coming because Habakkuk knows also that God is God and that God is his God. God has a relationship with him, that he can trust God. God is his salvation. 
Habakkuk can have joy and peace because he knows that God is faithful and powerful and good. Habakkuk began and ended his book and began and ended this prayer by referring to God as Yahweh, written here as Lord in all capital letters, which means he's using that personal covenantal name for God, the name that God gave his people as part of the relationship with them. It's a name of God that signals our relationship. He's the God who made this covenant with the people, and he can be trusted. His, his mercy can be trusted. And so we can have faith that he will be merciful. But how will that mercy come? Habakkuk doesn't actually get that answer here. He just trusts God. Habakkuk began with the question, how can God allow so much evil? And the answer God gave him is that sin will eventually be punished and God's people will eventually see God's justice. God will judge all the nations and all people. Now this is both good news and bad news. Habakkuk wanted God to judge sin. We all have a sense of justice in which we hate to see the evil that some people do go unpunished. We hate to see evil people get away with it and be prosperous. We want a world in which God judges evil. There are many people in America today who wonder about this world. They live in nice, peaceful neighborhoods. But once we see evil, once we experience evil, then we demand justice. We want God to do something about it because we hate naturally to see the evil people prosper. We want justice. So there's good news in knowing that nobody is going to get away with anything. God's timing might not be our timing, but he will judge evil. He will punish evil. But at the same time, if God is going to judge evil, then he's going to judge us too. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we've all done evil. We've all done things that we hope God will ignore. We don't want God to ignore the sins of others, but we do want him to ignore our sins. But that's not how it works. And so we try to convince ourselves that our sins are less sinful than others. Sure, we might have taken advantage of someone, but we didn't hurt them that badly. We might have insulted someone, but we didn't physically hurt them. Maybe we did physically hurt someone, but we didn't cause permanent damage to them. Maybe we stole something, but it was something small, and it was from a business, so they're not going to miss it anyway. We can go on and on excusing our own sins, but God will hold everyone accountable for every sin. And then where does that leave us? Good enough to warrant salvation, then everything else will just be forgiven and go away. So that means some sins won't actually be judged. Your sins will just be forgotten about. But this would be like a judge who decides your guilt or innocence for a crime based on your overall life. If you're a bad person, then you get convicted of this crime and you go to jail. But if you're basically a good person, then we'll just let this thing slide. We can forget about that. But Christians believe something very different. Every sin will be judged and every sin will be punished. No sin will be ignored because God is a God of perfect justice. God is holy and he maintains justice. So that's both good news because we really want a God of justice, but it's also really, really bad news. It's bad news because we deserve punishment for our sins. Imagine a judge in a court who said, yeah, this is going If you're a Christian, then in Jesus, God did judge your sins and he carried out the judgment against all of your sins. It was ultimately sin against God. And so God paid the penalty for you. God paid the price for you. Your sin was judged. The penalty was paid, but it was paid by God himself when he took your place and died on the cross. This is what it means here in Habakkuk when God says that the righteous will live by faith. If we look back at chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity. But the right way, this passage is quoted, and Paul contrasts living by your own works versus living in faith in the finished work of Jesus. 
Galatians was written to a church that was getting pulled back into thinking that they needed to earn salvation by following the law. And so Paul wrote, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written, Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. So the message of Galatians is that you can't earn salvation. It says, unless you follow the entire law perfectly, you're under a curse. And none of us have done that. So we can't earn our salvation. But even though we can't be good enough, Jesus was good enough for us. So what's left then? If Jesus is the only one who's good enough for us, what's left for us other than just as in Samuel was that there'd be a king in the line of David who would bring peace to the entire world forever. The promise in Isaiah was that a child would be born who would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. All of the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus. And so the righteous person lives by faith in Jesus. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're here today, ask yourself, what is your hope for justice in the world? The vast majority of crime is never solved. The vast majority of people in history have lived under tyrants. Even today, we see so much evil and oppression in the world. Is there any hope? Well, as Christians, we can say that there is hope in Jesus. Justice will be done, and yet mercy will be shown. For those who trust in Jesus, justice came when he took our place. He was executed by the Roman method of executing the very worst criminals, being nailed to a cross. He died a criminal's death, even though he was innocent, because he was dying in our place. And mercy was shown when his innocence was transferred to us because our penalty was paid. And yet we know that most people don't trust in Jesus. They either don't believe there will be justice, that God will judge, or they think that they'll be safe because they performed the right rituals, or because they did enough good to outweigh the bad, or because there's no God at all, and therefore there will be no justice. But in the end, everyone will be accountable for their sins, as much as the king of Babylon was. But it doesn't have to be that way, that they are individually held accountable for their sin and pay the penalty themselves. If you're here and you're not a Christian, today's an opportunity to turn to God and trust in him, trust in Jesus to take away that guilt, to take the penalty for you. It's an opportunity to trust and hope in both the justice of God, that sin will be judged, but also the mercy of God, that God pays the penalty for us. If you want to know more about that, ask us during lunch, talk to us. We would love to tell you about that. And for those of you who are Christians here, the book of Habakkuk is a reminder that even when we don't see what God is doing, God is working. Even when we don't understand what he's doing, he's working for our good. We might have times when we're like Habakkuk in chapter one, when we wonder, where is God? Why is he not stopping the evil around us? But we can rest assured that God is working and so we can be like Habakkuk at the end of the book when he concluded, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. Mm -hmm. So now let's close in prayer. Father, we praise you for your infinite goodness and justice and mercy and faithfulness for your infinite power, your infinite wisdom and knowledge. We know that there is no injustice in the world that you will see. And there is no injustice in the world that you will ignore. And so we can trust you. We can trust and say that vengeance is the Lord's. Even when we see weak and powerless people being oppressed, we know that there is no evil that will not be atoned for, that will not be judged. And so we just trust that sin was judged. 
And in exchange for our sin put upon him on the cross, he offers us his righteousness. And so we praise him and we celebrate him. And we just ask that you help us to grow, to be more like him by your spirit. Help us to to focus on Jesus as both our Lord and Savior. By your spirit, lead us.